John Osaroff is one of the leading mindset and behavior experts in the world. John has built five multi-million dollar companies, written two New York Times best-selling books, and featured in eight movies, including the blockbuster hit The Secret and Quest for Success with Richard Branson and the Dalai Lama. Today, he is founder and CEO of NeuroGym, a company dedicated to using the most advanced technologies and evidence-based brain training methods to help individuals unleash their fullest potential and maximize their results. John's latest book, Inner Size, The New Science to Unlocking Your Brain's Hidden Power, helps individuals recognize and release the mental and emotional blocks that prevents them from achieving their biggest goals and dreams. John, it's a pleasure to have you on and welcome to the show. Stephen, great to be on with you. Yeah, I remember, um, again, I haven't even mentioned this to you, but I remember watching The Secret many, many years ago. And um, I don't know if like, I know you were doing work, of course, in this field. You were already one of the preeminent mindset-based coaches. And I, and I want you to help us come up with a better term for that as well in the field. But I, I know that that was in such an explosive movie that kind of got your name out and a lot of the other names. Like I know Joe, I knew Joe Vitale, I knew your name, but not to that degree. What so? But I want to go beyond that movie, of course. But it was just such a great introduction to all of these people doing groundbreaking work, and that was kind of the movie, we'll say, that allowed for the exploration now to take it to the next level. So here today on the show, we're going to help take it to the next level. But I would love for you, because again, you have a very uh, impressive resume. What got you to into the secret? Like, what were you doing? And then we're going to say, okay, where have things come in the last however long it's been, fifteen years or so? Sure, uh, great question. So I've been an entrepreneur for most of my life from the time I was 19 when I got into real estate. Um, I just started building companies and um, I was into personal development. So I used reading as a vehicle to upgrade my knowledge and skills and awareness. I used you know, events that I went to to hear world renowned experts teaching me you know, skills, tools, technologies, methodologies, to get out of my own way and to see how much more I can achieve for my own life and for my employees. And then uh, in 1999, I um, took a company public on NASDAQ that was very, very successful. It was my second successful uh, company. And I retired for a few years and I just did a lot of research on, you know, what causes one person to really achieve success in their health and well-being, in their relationships. And like, what was the deeper than the surface uh, reasons? And I wrote a book called Having It All. And it became a New York Times bestseller because I dove into the neuroscience of success and the neuroscience that differentiates setting goals from what is happening in our brain that will cause us either to achieve goals or not. And uh, people loved the book and I got onto lots and lots of TV shows and radio shows. And um, then people started asking me if I do any seminars and the answer was no, I didn't do any coaching. I didn't do any seminars, I was retired. Uh, and then people said, well, you know, would you consider doing an event? And I said, well, sure. If people come to San Diego where I live where I'm retired, I'll do an event. And uh, I started doing events like every 120 days and they would sell out within days. And uh, so I just got into the personal development business of teaching. Not, I was never on my plan to do that. And um, my book became a New York Times bestseller. And a lady by the name of Rhonda Byrne heard about, you know, my book and the secret um, uh, is what she was working on. And I had a story in my book around a dream home you know, that I'd cut out of a magazine and I ended up living in that dream home, even though I didn't know how much it was or where it was when I cut out this picture. I didn't even know that I bought it when I moved into it. And um, she was like, oh my God, that's the law of attraction at work. And I said, well, I learned about the law of attraction. When I was 19 from Bob Proctor. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the premise was I, that we attract what we think about and resonate with most, most, which I don't agree with totally, but we'll get into that in just a, a little bit. And so she invited me to be in the movie. Mm. And all of a sudden, this movie was seen by 500 million people. And here I get invited to Ellen DeGeneres and to, and to uh, Larry King and to Anderson Cooper and to every TV and radio show in the world. And because I was um, <clears throat> the guy uh, that explain stuff at the neuroscience level and then psychological level, which is my passion. I got invited to a lot of shows with 
you know, some professors who were dissing the law of attraction, you know, as some kind of metaphysical airy fairy stuff. But whenever I said to them, great. So, you know, when I take a tuning fork, you know, and I hit the A440 key on a piano, the tuning fork vibrates and there's no strings between the tuning fork and the piano. Does that mean that they are not in resonance, therefore, you know, oscillating at the same vibrational rate? They go, no, that is happening. I said, oh, so there's stuff happening, you know, beneath our level of awareness or ability to see with our eyes that maybe we just need to understand more about. So long story short, the secret put many of us into this, uh, uh, stratospheric um, um, stage of our businesses because people got fascinated with, do my thoughts matter? Um, do my emotions matter? I know my behavior matters, but is there something other than that? And uh, so that's how I got into the movie The Secret. And that's how I got to really accelerate the stuff that I'm doing. Then I wrote several more books that became bestsellers. And I've just been on this journey now for, for about 15 years or so of researching, creating programs, writing about it, uh, doing interviews to help people understand that they have a hundred billion dollar brain that when they learn how to use it a little bit better, they can exponentially increase their results. Uh, that's a great summary, too, because I was going to ask you, you know, what exactly is this law of attraction <clears throat> for people that haven't heard of it before? But that's I mean, that's really how I explain it as well. It's a it's a law of vibration. And so that actually scientific based law. We can debate how it's actually happening, but there's really science behind it. There are frequencies that are um, emanated out there and we're either picking them up, we're giving them off. And obviously, probably both are happening at the same exact time. So I think one of the things that you just said about that is true. It's like, okay, the secret, if we look back and if I were to watch it now, I mean, I haven't watched it in, in you know a long time, well over 10 years. Um, you might look at it as like, oh, well, this is, you know, this is we, we know this now, but back then, this was, it was a lot of new information. I, I had already been studying this type of thing previous to that, but because Bob Proctor, um, Zig Ziglar, Jim Rohn, they talked about it in different ways. Not exactly like this. Then the movie comes out and I think a lot of people identified with different, um, we'll say characters in the movie, right? Different people in the movie. And I definitely, I would say, um, resonated with what you were saying because you were saying it from a science-based perspective and you were saying this is what it looks like this is what it could be and now we're getting at it at a deeper level so i would love to ask you now that the movie's been out for how many years now when, when did that debut 2006 or 7 something like that yeah about 15 years ago or so that's all that makes sense so when we look at it now, I would love to know, you know, if you just can point out one thing. So someone's just coming, they're, they're in the beginning of their journey because I have my own thoughts, but what's the number one thing, like the biggest secret that the movie, The Secret left out? Like what's that missing factor, would you say? So I'll tell you what I loved about the movie and what I didn't. Mm -hmm. So what most people don't know is every one of the speakers went into a hotel room independent of each other to sit on this chair with a green screen behind us. Mm. And we were just asked some questions, almost like this interview right now. And we answered the questions. And then Rhonda, who was the, you know, the gal who came up with the movie, The Secret, she did all the Hollywood magic behind everything to create such a phenomenal story. So that's part one. Okay. So in the movie, the, the underlying theme, right, is think, believe, and you'll achieve. Mm -hmm. Think, believe, and you'll achieve, right? So a lot of people misunderstood that for, I need to think wealthy thoughts. I need to, you know, believe that I can do this. And then whoosh, magically, you know, door's going to knock. Somebody's going to be at the front door. You open the door and go, hey, some little bird told us that you've been thinking and you really believe that you deserve a million dollars and here it is. And a lot of people got this misunderstanding between thinking, how can I achieve making a hundred thousand dollars or 25 extra thousand or 5,000 or getting out of debt or this new car? Um, what do I need to believe about myself in order to resonate with that? What do I need to believe about? Is it even possible for me to achieve that? Um, and then the part that people missed on mass is in the word attraction, 
Very few people look at the last six letters, and that's A C T I O N. A C T I O N means action. Now, it's not just any kind of action. If there is this play uh, in a participatory universe that we live in, we know that we live in a sea, okay, of energy, quanta, information, right? And we know that for um, this C, okay, to materialize from potential to product or material, uh, something must have to happen. And somehow these uh, electrons and neutrons and leptons um, and uh, protons need to coalesce, you know, uh, into molecules you know, or atoms and molecules to create something in physical form on this physical world. So from the non-physical, we manifest to the physical. And is it possible that I need to understand how to behave to get this hundred trillion cell structure called a human? Okay, my name that my parents gave me is one thing. You know, this meat suit is another thing. The organs in it's another thing. The systems that operate it is another thing. The electrical activity and the neurochemicals that are firing in my brain and your brain, everybody's brain right now is another thing. Is it possible that I am somehow affecting this unseen world with my predominant thoughts, with my predominant emotions, and with my predominant behaviors. Is it possible that this interrelationship, right, in this participatory universe, is it possible that when I have thoughts of how I can, why I must, how I will, I'm actually activating the neurochemistry and the electrical activity that that collapses the wave function at the quantum level from wave particle or wave function to a particle. Is it possible? And all the research shows that yes, that is possible and probable in what's happening. So mm -hmm. if my brain is an electromagnetic switching station that allows light in through my eyes, we don't see with our eyes, we see through our eyes and it's our brain that sees. We allow sound in through our ears, right? And through an electrical and chemical process, we are able to hear. I can touch something and send an electrical message through my nervous system to my brain, and it deciphers what that pen is. Even though my eyes are closed, I'm firing the neurons that have this relationship with this pen because I've got cells of recognition. So is it possible that if I get my thoughts aligned on what I want, with the beliefs required to achieve it, and I can behave in ways that create predictable results instead of possible results, I can tune in like a radio station tunes in to rock and roll at 95.5 is rock and roll. It's not jazz, mm -hmm. but at 95.6, it might be jazz. Is it possible for me to tune into the frequency of exactly what I want, like a radio tuning into a frequency that's already in the room mm -hmm. for music they want to hear? And then by me taking the right actions, I can create the success that I want because it's already here? Hmm. That's what people miss. Mm -hmm. They miss that action part, but creating that coherence, okay, between the thoughts, emotions, feelings, sensations, and behaviors. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that in the movie. And and you're explaining also the other part that I believe now people are leaving out today. They're saying, okay, I have, I've, you know, I've created the vision board, right? I've followed what John's been talking about. I um I believe I can do this, but we'll get to that in a second, because I think there's there's much more on a subconscious and nervous system based level. And then I'm taking the actions day in and day out because there's a lot of people that work 80 hours a week and they're working towards their goals and they're not really that much further ahead. But there's some people that seem to be able to achieve that with far less effort. And for me, and again, I would love you to be able to add more uh, color to this and, and correct any place that I'm off. 
I really, I've looked into why, why do some people like we can say, oh, this person's a good person or a bad person, right? We can say this person's this or this person's that, but yet everybody is able to achieve it, even if they're doing it for the wrong reasons and for negative reasons as well and very selfish reasons. So I, I look at it now as it is feeling and conviction. It's actually already believing that, not that it's done, because you can't always convince yourself that it's done, but you are that person. Meaning like, you're not just worthy, you are that person. I kind of look at it as like professional athletes. When a professional athlete is at the top of their game, there's a level of, not just flow, there's a level of basically ego where I am the best. Like I'm going to pull up to that three pointer and I'm going to hit it because nobody else should have the ball in their hand with five seconds left in the game and the game on the line. Or when it's, you know, Tiger Woods back in the heyday, uh, I am no matter what, if I have the lead going into Sunday, there is no chance that you're going to beat me. I follow the UFC. I'm looking at certain UFC fighters. What happens when they're hungry going for the belt? versus afterwards. So it's this, it's like, it's not even a belief, it is knowing and it's a part of who you are. Please let me know if if I'm onto something there. And then also, if we're not that person, how do we get there? Yeah, um, you've hit on a lot of different points. And uh, there's only four things that can get in our way. And before I share with you what the four things are, let's maybe all have an agreement on this one premise that I have. And so it's, um, you know, 2021, 2022, okay, time frame. And there's 107 or 8 billion humans that have walked on Earth. We've been doing science for about 500 or 500 years, give or take. Um, and so we've discovered a bunch of stuff about humanity and how to do things and how not to do things. And would you agree that if you had to achieve health goals, relationship goals, financial goals, business goals, career goals, uh, spiritual goals, that today is probably the best day alive for us to have the accumulated information, knowledge, and skills from the history of our species, and we could find that out in less than five minutes on Google. Yeah, 100%, we can find yeah, 100%. a book, a course, a video, a coach, a mentor, a podcast of everything that we should do and shouldn't do. So that means that we are at the best time of our lives, the history of our species to be able to achieve even more. So there are four things that hold people back. And when we look at it from a neuroscience or neuropsychology perspective, we understand that our brain, even though it's made up of mostly water and fat, we know that we have three major networks in our brain, like, you know, like a telephone network around the world. We have three major networks, the salience network, the default mode network, and the executive functioning network. We also know that we have a fear circuit. We have a motivational circuit. We have a spiritual circuit. We have a self-doubt circuit. And we know that when certain circuits or networks are activated. Here's what this organism called our brain does, which causes this body of ours to either take action or not, to move towards something or move away from it. So we understand that. And since our brain is wired for safety and comfort first, safety and survival first, excuse me, safety and survival first, and then um, um, moving away from anything real or imagined that could cause us to be uncomfortable or for us to feel any type of mental or emotional, financial pain or discomfort. We move away from that first. We do number one and two um, uh, in a way that conserves the most amount of energy. And the way we do that is we develop these automatic triggers that causes certain behaviors for the protection of those things. And then as long as we feel safe and secure and there's no real threat, we then maybe will look to gain more pleasure. So that is how this organism works. If you were to take away, you know, my face and my hair and, you know, and, and even take my skull away, what you'd be left with is that. <laughs> you'd be left with a brain, right, with a nervous system that is triggered you know, in certain ways because of external stimuli or because I have this vision or a goal for my life and based on security and safety, avoidance of pain, conservation of energy, and then move towards pleasure, this brain of mine is going to make decisions. So having that as our fundamental framework, 
what happens when we have a goal to be really healthy, you know, to lose weight, keep it off, and to, and to uh, extend our lifespan in a healthy way. Well, we can have that as a goal, and that's all great. And we might even feel good, and, you know, uh, the anticipation of that will release that dopamine in our brain, and we'll feel like, oh, my God, this is awesome. We'll high-five, and we'll hug our husband or wife, and, and we'll feel amazing. But then in the very next nanosecond, when you... When your brain says, yeah, but but last time that you tried this, you failed. Um, The last time you made this commitment to yourself that this is the book, this is the podcast, this is the teacher, this is the blank, um, you didn't follow through to completion or you started and stopped or you achieved some success and then you reverted back, you know, to all of your old behaviors. Um, You're just going to disappoint yourself if you do this again. So all of this, what I'm just saying, is happening behind or beneath your level of awareness. Our brain understands our patterns better than we do. Why? Because the patterns that we've repeated move from a conscious pattern that we may, you know, um, uh, deliberately create, but then it moves to an unconscious pattern that operates in a conservation energy mode to do what? To keep us safe and away from any real or imagined pain or discomfort. So if we don't have the knowledge and skill of how we're going to achieve that goal, chances are we will trigger that stress response or the sympathetic nervous system that you're very familiar with, Stephen. And so what can trigger this stress is when the demand required for the goal achievement part of what we wanna do, when the demand exceeds my capacity, my stress circuits gets activated. When the demand exceeds the capacity, not that we can't upgrade, right, our knowledge and skills, but when the demand exceeds the capacity, this trigger, the fight, flight, freeze, or faint circuit activates automatically. No differently than if you're driving your car down the highway, you know, and um, your car, you know, gets a little flat tire. The signal pops up on your dash. You don't take the hammer you know, the maybe sitting on the front seat and hit the hit the dash. You say, oh, some there's a signal that just went on to warn me, to make me aware. Now, when this signal gets activated in the average person, since they don't have a lot of training in awareness and in emotional management and regulation, they want to suppress or eliminate this uncomfortable feeling they have as a result of whether it's adrenaline or cortisol or epinephrine or norepinephrine that's going through their bloodstream. And what they don't know is with a simple, simple inner size, a mental technique uh, of breathing in as slowly as you can through your nose and breathing out as slowly as you can through your mouth as if you're blowing out through a straw you can actually deactivate the sympathetic nervous system in less than 90 seconds, which is the fight, flight, freeze circuit. Um, And it's the automatic reactive circuit to a potential threat or pain or discomfort or real. Uh, And you can actually activate the parasympathetic nervous system, which is our calm circuit that allows us to respond using what I call is the Einstein part of the brain versus allowing the Frankenstein's monster to run wild. So when we're dealing with achievement of goals, if we don't have the knowledge and skills, then we have uncertainty and doubt. And in the uncertainty and doubt, we may have fears and we may have stress. Number two, you mentioned something earlier about you know professional athletes or CEOs Uh, around there, you know, give me the last shot. Tiger Woods, if I'm leading, okay, going into the final round, I'm winning. Well, that's an identity. Mm -hmm. That's an identity. And when our identity doesn't match our destiny, stress circuits activated again, fear circuit, uncertainty circuit, self-doubt circuit, anxiety circuit is activated when there's a mismatch between our identity and our destiny. So, The question is, can we upgrade our identity to match the destiny that we want? Can we upgrade? And if the answer is yes, then what does it actually mean? 
Like, where is our identity? Where is our, our self-image? Where, where is self-worth? Where is self-esteem? Where is self-confidence? Like, where is it? Well, we don't know exactly where it is, but we do know that it is a cluster of reinforced neural patterns because we weren't born with an identity. We weren't born with a self-image. We weren't born with self-confidence. We weren't born with fears. We weren't born with anything other than potential. And so we became conditioned or wired and our brain created neural networks and connections that went from um, automatic creation based on our environment in the imprinting years or the modeling years as we were children from our parents, our teachers, television, school, et cetera. And then once those patterns were repeated, they moved from conscious effort to create them to unconscious automatic patterns that operate based on cues from our external or internal world. So now we're talking about upgrading our self-image or identity to match our destiny. And I'll show you an inner size a little bit on how to do that. So that's two things that could be holding us back. Third thing is uh, limiting belief. But what is a limiting belief? Again, I want to go back to if you own a hundred billion dollar brain, which you do, an organism, and uh, you weren't born with any beliefs, then your beliefs about what's possible or what's not possible is nothing more than a series of connected neurons, brain cells, networks, circuits uh, in your brain that get activated and reinforced. So if you believe you're too young or too old, if you uh, believe that you don't have enough of this or too much of that, whatever you believe happens to make up the lens by which your brain actually sees the world. But it also drives behavior. Why? Um, between self-image and beliefs, we have to, uh, we we're always creating um, psychological constants. And so psychological constants means that what I believe in the inside must match and be constant with what I see and experience on the outside. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, part of what our brain does is it's projecting what's on the inside onto the canvas on the outside. So everybody thinks that, you know, we see what's out there. No, we don't. We project what's in here onto the canvas out there. And our brain deletes and distorts anything that doesn't match the internal map of our reality that we've created in here. So if we have limiting beliefs, then basically our brain is turning off all of the other stations as if, you know, I'm using the radio analogy I gave earlier. It's tuning out everything else and it's keeping us locked on the belief stations that we have. So now we have three things again in our way. And then the fourth one, which is the, probably one of the easiest to, um, to uh, fix, is we have over 50 different types of fear that hold us humans back. So again, if we go into the premise of, you know, why do I do what I do? Why don't I do the things I know I should do or I want to do? Like I want to, but I'm not. I'm procrastinating or self sabotage Why? Well, is it possible that as you're thinking about, let's say, releasing weight and keeping it off and being healthier, is it possible that your brain is also, even though you have this goal and this vision, you have this really big reason why you want to do it? Is it also possible that deep in the recesses of your mind, your brain is also saying, but what if you start and you don't follow through like you didn't last time. Then your spouse is going to say, there you did it again. You just spent more money on that doctor, on those pills, potions, and courses, and you're not doing shit with it. And so you don't want to deal with that. And your brain's predicting all the time. Our brain is predicting a possible negative outcome in the future that in the prediction of that possible negative outcome in the future, we're actually releasing the neurochemicals associated with that. And we're feeling it now. And that puts a break on motivation behavior. So our brain's predicting, uh, is it possible that you're going to fail? Yes. Is it possible you're going to start, succeed, and then fail? Yes, just like you did the last 10 times. Is it possible that if you fail, you might be embarrassed or ashamed or ridiculed or judged or even rejected? Yes. Well, who the hell 
goes forward thinking those are possibilities. Not the average person because they don't know how to manage the emotion with techniques. They don't understand enough about the emotion is perfect, but maybe you're reacting to it at your highest level of training. And maybe it's just a training issue, but not the emotion. Maybe you need to learn how to respond to this emotion so that you control it versus it controlling you. Now we have a skill opportunity. So all of these things are interrelated to keep you safe and secure, to keep you avoiding pain or discomfort, to keep conserving energy all before you get the prize and the joy. So when we're talking about the complexity of the brain, we can also simplify some things so that we can just get a little bit better. And with getting a little bit better by working on the little hinge or hinges that swing the big doors, Mm -hmm. we can actually fulfill more of our potential instead of standing on the edge of it, right? And so that's the domain that I've been fascinated with because I know that we all have so much potential and every brain works the same way. Like There's anomalies, I get that, there's anomalies, but for 99.9% .9 of us, your brain and my brain works the same. It's not like you have four circuits and I have two. No, you've got the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere and you've got, you know, the neocortex and the limbic system and you've got the same components, the same members of the orchestra and some people are better at getting the coherence of the orchestra to achieve success faster and easier versus, you know, imagine if, you, if you're an orchestra leader, you're, you're the leader of a band and one of the members, one of the musicians is out of whack. I don't care how good the other musicians are, that music will not sound good. That's called chaos. Mm -hmm. But when you create coherence and you create harmony between the different circuits and networks in your brain, and you match it up with the behaviors, now, oh, wow, this is in, this is, that's what people call this, I'm in flow. This is effort less. This is stress less, right? Mm -hmm. But most people have never studied how do I get into and stay into flow more frequently than chaos, 100%. No, I, I, I think that's Sorry a great... for the long-winded answer, but, you know, <laughs> no, that was great. you've got a, a medical background. I know the people that are listening to you, you know, probably like the science behind it a little bit more because all the answers we need are here and they've never been as clear and accurate as they are today. Will they be better in 20, 30, 50 years? Yes. 100%. And we're going to talk about where this field is moving. But, you know, a lot of what you describe our listeners, our audience will be familiar with because, yes, we talk about these things on Mondays, but we talk about the nervous system and blending with that subconscious mind. I mean, the subconscious mind is essentially our nervous system. And it's a great way for us to be able to get um, all the things that we've already been conditioned and wired already to know and believe that have really taken place, what, before the age of six years old, before the age of eight years old, and yes, they're reinforced over life, but the nice thing is that we can rewire those. And there, there are specific techniques to do that. And the truth is that, just like you said, everything that we can think of right now, someone's pretty much already explored, created a blueprint, a course, a methodology for achieving. So in my field, let's say someone has uh, gut issues like SIBO or candida or parasites. We already know how to remove those. You can remove them by conventional medicine means or by natural health means. If you have intestinal permeability, we know how to seal back up the gut. We know how to help with autoimmune. We know how to help with high cholesterol, high blood pressure, psoriasis, you name it. So the the issue Which are is all effects. That's right. Exactly. Every one of those things are effects. Mm -hmm. And what I love about what you do as a functional medicine doc is you're focusing on cause to fix the effect. Too That's many right. people are focusing on the effect and they're wondering, they're focusing on the effect. They're wondering why they keep recreating the effect because that's where their attention and energy goes. So Anyway, right. keep going. And they're not, so they're, they're looking at, okay, here's this end goal and it's so far away from me. But what they don't understand is, first of all, you don't have to have all the answers up front. 
And like, it, that's, that's impossible, but you just have to have the belief that this is achievable. Someone else has done it. So I probably should be able to, just because of what you just said, we all have the same brain. Yeah. There's going to be variations, but we all have the same ability to be able to do this. Your wiring, your conditioning might be different than another person. You could have, uh, more attributes in one area than another. However, these things can be learned. So it's, it's the belief that first of all, it can be achieved. That's where so many people fall off in the first place is you don't actually think it's doable. Never mind the how. The how can always be figured out, but you don't even believe that it's even possible. But then you start to meet someone, okay, you know, they might not believe me, they might not believe you, but okay, someone else then like them in their family, their friends, whatever, looked at it, it was able to achieve it. Now all of a sudden they start to grow a little bit in belief in themselves. And I love how in your book, um, Inner Size here, I really like this because I do believe that, you know, it's if you're making $60,000 a year, probably don't aim for a million dollars the next year. You can, I'm not saying that, but do you actually believe you can make a million dollars the next year? You talk about find somewhere that's actually believable from night, right there, from right now, and then be able to scale from there. Could you go a little bit more? Because I do believe that a lot of people took from the, the movie, The Secret as well. Well, I just have to believe, I just have to think it, that I can just have this and I'm going to hit it when it's so far off from what they actually am able to visualize in the first place. Yeah. So um, when we're talking about goal achieving, um, we need, you know, what is it that we want to achieve, why we want to achieve it, how we're going to achieve it, when are we going to achieve it by. Um, and so we need a, a variety of different pieces uh, to the puzzle. Um, people usually set goals that they think they can achieve or it's just outside their comfort zone. So they have a little bit of risk you know, to get that little adrenaline going. Um, and then there's some people who've actually learned the way to manage their emotions and their mindset enough that they can set a big goal and achieve it because they say, okay, I know that my brain is going to fire off you know, the stress chemicals, okay, because I don't have all the knowledge or skills. I don't have the money. I don't have the tools. I don't have the resources. I don't have the connection. I don't have to be able to achieve that goal. And they know that it's normal for them to feel uncertain, to feel a lack of confidence. Mm -hmm. And so when we set goals that, um, that scare us, it can be good, but to the untrained person, it could flood your bloodstream with the neurochemicals that just cause you to freeze and not do anything unless you know how to release those chemicals from your bloodstream, uh, breathing is one of them, yawning and maybe caressing your hand, your arms for 90 seconds is another one. But you also have to know how to frame things in a way that will empower you versus disempower you. You also have to know that if you're lacking the knowledge and skills, that there may be people that you could bring on to help you that have the knowledge or skills. You have to know that even though you may have limiting beliefs, you can create empowering beliefs that will open up your brain's perspective and open up the paradigm center of your brain as well. That'll help you see more of the possibilities versus the obstacles. But this is a skill that most people can learn and it's not what we teach in school, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's possible to achieve, and I often use, you know, a marathon as an example. Uh, if I said, hey, can you run a marathon right now? Like I'm in really good shape, okay? And I can't jog a marathon nonstop right now, mm -hmm. okay? But if everybody who's watching or listening said, yeah, a year from now, let's run a marathon. Even if you're out of shape right now, even if your diet sucks, you don't exercise. The most exercise you get is from the sofa to the fridge. Um, guess what? If you made a commitment that a year from now, we're going to run a marathon. And today, all we did was walk for one minute. And tomorrow, all we did was walk for one or two minutes. And we developed the habit of walking for the first week for one minute a day. And then we said, okay, uh, what should my diet be like? Okay, what would a proper exercise regimen be like to train myself? What would a proper rest regimen be like? Uh, what would be a good massage therapy regimen? What would be a good, you know, uh, cardiovascular aerobic workout be versus a non uh, or an anaerobic workout be? We could learn everything needed 
after we make the decision to achieve a marathon a year from now. And if people were committed to upgrading their knowledge and skills, to helping each other, to being on track every day in an organized, methodical way, I would bet that 98% of the people right now that would say yes to that could jog even as slowly as possible 365 days from today a marathon. So it's not the lack of how, right? If you want to solve a two by two Rubik's cube, you can go to YouTube and do it and learn the algorithm. If you want to solve a four by four or five by five or six by six Rubik's cube, even though you've never solved it before, all the how to exists on YouTube for free. Mm -hmm. So the problem isn't how to. The problem is a lack of commitment, which means I'm going to do whatever it takes legally, professionally, ethically, of course, um, to achieve the goal. And then I'm going to let go of the beliefs that don't serve me. I'm going to get rid of the habits that control me. I'm going to get rid of the self-image that wants to hold me back, feeling like I either don't deserve it or I can't. Mm -hmm. And if I work on those things to remove the obstacles and to upgrade you know, my identity to match my destiny and my behaviors to match what I want to achieve, I can achieve way more than I'm achieving right now. Uh, but so the problem isn't that you can't. The problem is you haven't committed to the outcome no matter what. That's the bigger problem. And that means that you either lack the motivation, which is the motive for action. Mm -hmm. And that means that you don't have a big enough why. Why must you do it versus why should you or why you want to? We don't do what we should or, or we do what we must do. So whenever you're setting any goal, ask yourself, why must you? What will it make of you? Who will you help other than you? What kind of character would it help you build? What kind of journey will it help you have? What kind of options will it give you? And then say, if I don't, then what kind of character will I reinforce? If I don't, what kind of lifestyle will I have to settle for? If I don't, you know, then what will my self-image of myself be? And isn't that something you should be afraid of, reinforcing if you don't want those things? So we can use the character of the stick to motivate us, to give us motives for actions. And we can also motivate us by saying, I want to move away from this for sure as well, because I refuse to be that person. Yes. Yeah, I think I think negative future projecting versus the positive future projecting can be a more powerful catalyst because it can, you know, give that nervous system the charge that it needs to say, listen, this can't happen any longer. You're putting yourself in some type of danger, whether it be physical or mental, emotional, whatever it might be, or it might be family. Because a lot of times I found that people won't do it for themselves. But if you can get them to understand that it's for their spouse or it's for their children or their grandchildren being healthy to stay around for them, and then it could be, okay, yeah, maybe it's not about me. Maybe it's for other people as well or the service that you're able to provide to others. And everything that we're talking about right now, I mean, really, like you, you just said, John, is like everything, there's a how-to. So there's a method for you, no doubt about it. And I love the marathon example because uh, absolutely 98%, 100%, could do it. They could make it happen no matter where they're at, at today. They could consistently jog that marathon and make it happen. Now, the, the problem is, uh, is simply getting to that starting point, right? Because you'd have to join that group. You'd have to make that commitment. Because after that, I found one of the reasons why you hire a coach or you hire a mentor or you're part of a group is that they help with the consistency. Because most people will say, I have a year to achieve that marathon. So what do they start? Well, a month before two months before. And now that's a total, totally different situation. But also the big part of joining a group and hiring a mentor is that you get to borrow their confidence. You borrow their self-image. And when you do that, you might say, listen, mine is growing. I'm rewiring my circuitry. But for right now, my coach believes in me. This group believes in me. I think I can achieve that as well. So that's one of the best things I've seen with online groups. Those are powerful. But whenever you have, and I, I would say, you know, someone that manages you, that really 
talks to you when you're a little bit down, that motivates you, but keeps you consistent and also accountable, right? Because a lot of times we humans will slack off when things are okay, right? But we need someone to say, listen, yeah, things are okay right now, but they're not going to stay okay if you continue with this trajectory. So, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And then also, um, and I, cause I wanted to ask you this question. Is there anyone, like, is there a school right now that is actually teaching this. So I know it's a two part, but I wanna make sure I don't forget that next question. Cause I don't think that they're teaching, they're teaching neuroscience of course, but are they teaching neuroscience in terms of life achievement? I don't know, I haven't seen that. I mean, that's why I started myneurogym.com, right? Is to, is to really teach uh, the brain stuff. So, so a, a couple of thoughts popped into my head. One of which is in play right now. So I'll share some with you. Let me see if I get the exact uh, date, but it was like 20, days ago or so. I've got a text from a friend of mine. Um, uh, anyway, this guy makes millions a year in business. Successful marriage, successful dad, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, about a month ago, 20 some odd days ago, uh, we were on a call and he, he was drinking uh, Coca-Cola. Um, not even the sugar-free one, but he was drinking one. Then he had another one. And um, I said, hey, blank, blank, what's with all the soft drink that you're drinking? He said, oh, yeah, I have about 10 of these a day. I said, what? You have, do you realize that each can has got like 47 or 50 grams of sugar in it? It's just liquefied? And you're drinking 10 of them a day? Do you have any idea what you're doing to the inside? He says, yeah, I've tried to stop all of these years and I just, you know, I stop for a day or two or three and then I do it again. So I'll make you a deal. And this goes to a point you were just making. I said, you and I are friends. I care about you. I love you. I said, um, you know, it's bad for you, right? Yes. You know what it's going to do to you, you know, possibly border, you know, diabetes, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He knows all, knew all the consequences. Mm -hmm. I said, um, are you willing to do a little experiment with me? He said, sure. I said, why don't you commit to stopping your soft drinks right now? Take your last sip, commit to stopping it right now. And all I want you to do for 30 days, I want you to text me by 10 p.m. your time that you completed just that day. Mm -hmm. So he did it day one, did it day two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, day 14. He says, hey, John, I didn't even think about having one today. Day 15, oh my God, I almost forgot to text you because it's like, I didn't do it. We were on like day 20 or 21 last night. And he says, this is incredible. But just having you to text, to hold myself accountable to you, he doesn't pay me, he's a friend, yeah. uh, has changed my entire belief about what I can do because I've tried so many other times. I said, well, first you made a commitment. We picked a timeline of 30 days. We picked one behavior that you have to be accountable for to yourself, and that's don't drink the Coke. And two, to me, text me, just let me know you did. So now, not only are you doing it for you, but you don't want to be embarrassed or ashamed having to tell me, oh, God, I, I drank the Coke. So a little bit of coaching, a little bit of commitment, and some small action steps of accountability go a long, long way from a neuroscience perspective of changing behavior. Now, I mentioned to him um, a bunch of times, all the latest research shows that in order for a new pattern to override an old pattern and stick takes between 66 days and 365 days. So all of my clients, my private ones and my group coaching clients, whenever they come into my environment, they have to commit to 100 days. If they don't commit to 100 days, don't buy my programs, products, services, because then you're going to hold me responsible. And I'll be responsible if you commit to 100 days, because then I can help you create the neural patterns long enough for them to reinforce themselves and create you. That's right. So and basically them, what you're doing is you're creating a new identity over correct. 100 days. And that's, with, I with mean, that's- With the beliefs, with the self-image, yep. with the new habits, with the behaviors, with the reinforcement- Hundred percent. No, I mean I, I love that, and and that's what I try to do is is really simplify things for people because if you create the the self belief that it can happen or the identity that you can make it happen, you're going to have ups and downs. Like there's no doubt about it. Like everyone, like 
for your friend might go out to a dinner and then all of a sudden start drinking that Coke and not even realize it, right? So like, okay, that's a fall off, but he realizes it and now he knows, okay, when he goes out to dinner, he can't fall into those poor habits again. So we all have ups and downs, but if all of a sudden you create the belief or the identity, you're going to be the type of person that will see it through no matter what. And that's what I think sky's the limit. You know, it's kind of like getting to that place first and however you can do it, whether it's through you know, um, uh, you know, using binaural beats and, and different um, subconscious based mantras being implemented or through a coach or whatever it might be is I think they're all steps along the way. And a lot of people I know that I did, you know, again, I really got into this work about, let's say, almost 20 years ago, but definitely 15 years ago, is that I thought that I would arrive and that it would just click. And that was never the case for me. It might might have been for you. But what it was was an accumulation of knowledge and beliefs and then going about all the different things that I learned in childhood and basically rewiring this. Oh, this popped up, rewiring this. This came up, th rewiring this. And now it really is like a self-fulfilling prophecy because like you talk about in your book, now I'm more self-aware. When these little negative patterns pop up, I, I think you might have called them ants or something like that. When they pop up, I say, oh, okay, yeah. Well, I just basically talk to myself. Listen, there it is again. You don't need to listen to that because you already know that's not you. So I don't identify it with it. And now it's much easier to override. So again, like I think this field is absolutely amazing. And I also understand that there are probably levels to this. And I have levels to go, but I'm now Dude. enjoying the process. Yeah, listen, it's... it's um it's like a, a martial art. It's like learning a new language. It's like, um, you know, let, let's say you, you want to get to know New York City. And let's say you have a limited amount of time and you're at the airport at LaGuardia and you say, I want to go see Manhattan. You hop in that helicopter and you do a helicopter tour of Manhattan. Oh my God, this is unbelievable. Look at this. And then you say, well, God, I've been to Manhattan. Well, You've seen Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And let's say you look down on your way back to the airport and you see Central Park and you go, okay, I'm going to come back here and I'm actually going to take a tour of Central Park. So the helicopter lands, you take a tour of Central Park. Say, oh my God, I really know Manhattan. And you go, well, you know what? There's another level. Let's hire somebody who's lived here for 50 years. Let have, let's have them take you for a tour just of this neighborhood. And you're like, oh my God, this is incredible. And you go, well, you know what? I'm going to come and live here. Right. So there's always another layer of this awareness and of this knowledge. And so when we're dealing with the domain of performance, human performance, my own performance, your own performance, um, awareness is one of the greatest neural muscles that you can strengthen. So awareness of the ants is awareness of my automatic negative thoughts, mm -hmm. awareness of the um, of the uh, uh, automatic negative emotions is another part of it. Uh, awareness of my disempowering behaviors, that's an awareness. Uh, awareness of the stories and excuses that I ke keep using, awareness of my procrastination, awareness of you know, my habits, awareness of you know, what's causing my results. These are all layers of awareness that the more we are aware without judgment, blame, shame, guilt, or justification, yes. without judgment, blame, shame, guilt, or justification, um, the more we're aware of the software, the easier it is for us to re-engineer the software, right? So we shouldn't be worried or, or have a fear of radical honesty and radical awareness of self and of results and behaviors. And when you do that from a healthy perspective of I am prepared to grow, I'm prepared to become more so I can have more and give more and enjoy more, um, then it's a healthy relationship with oneself for saying, oh, no, I don't want to see what's there. Well, what do you mean you don't want to see what's there? What's there is the obstacle. <laughs> mm -hmm. That is your key to freedom. So yes. uh, you're 100% you're right. It's like, you know, once you become a black belt, you realize you need to practice the basics every day. That's right. Yeah. And it's, it's bettering your best. I mean, that's really what it's about. If someone tries to compare themselves to where you are today, to their starting point, it's unfair. You know, it's unfair for anyone to do that. So simply uh, going about each day is just saying, Hey, I'm just going to try to do a little bit better than yesterday. I mean, if you do that, that that's when exponential change can really take place. So one of the things that I love in my field, and it's the same for yours as well as that when, so, you know, what I look at, just like you spoke about before root cause. So if you name any disease, we understand that the disease 
disease is uh, simply a manifestation of symptoms caused by one or multiple root causes. So how do you fix the disease? Well, the, the truth is that you never have to worry about the disease, like the end goal. You don't have to worry about the end goal. What you need to do is fix the things that leads to the end goal. And I call it the rain barrel effect. So it's like the filling up or overflowing of the body's systems. And it could be from the nervous system, the immune system, the gut, whatever it might be. But in this field, there's also the the horizon, the, the, the next level in terms of looking at anti-aging, which is a field that I'm very much into. And so I know where the field is moving in terms of automation, AI, continuous glucose monitors, smart chips and these devices, all things that I, I'm you know, currently working with different companies on and I love. So I'm assuming the same is taking place with the performance-based field in terms of mindset. And I would love to hear how you yourself and also companies are taking this field to the next level. Yeah, so as we speak, I'm working on an AI-powered platform for personal development that'll act as your you know, private coach, therapist, psychiatrist in your pocket on your mobile phone that will connect, obviously, um, to your biometrics and um, to what may be triggering your fear or anxiety or stress um, or lack of confidence or lack of certainty or procrastination or self-sabotage so that you can have an awareness of patterns so that you can switch the patterns by doing one or more of our inner sizes or our inner size stacks, as I call them. So yes. we do exercise to strengthen our muscles and you know internal organs, et cetera, and lig ligaments, tissues, et cetera. Well, uh, why not strengthen your core neural muscles? Why not stop using the muscles you know that are holding you back and start creating the new neural muscles of confidence, certainty, awareness, focus, beliefs, habits, uh, deliberately because you can. Yeah, hundred percent. I can see that being used with things like neurofeedback, biofeedback, haptic feedback, a vibration when you're making a positive or negative. Feedback, bio. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's there's an, a you know virtual reality, augmented reality, mm -hmm. um, integration of all of the technologies is where we're going, right? As my, yeah. even as much as in some cases there are chips that are being put in people's brains right now uh, that may have uh, you know limited uh, bodily functionality that um, their brain can read uh, you know thought patterns and create computer commands that can create you know a robot to to give them something to drink. It's like yes. with thought, yeah, with thought. Hundred percent, and and I've seen some of those devices in there rudimentary based stages. And I know that they're advancing right now just with thought and moving the robot robots like you just spoke about. One thing I think that would be deeply helpful for a lot of people is, well, I mean, first things first, which we, we did touch on is that, you know, people need to get super clear about what it is that they want, because until they're clear, it's very difficult to end up knowing what your goal, what your destination is. But if you were able to do that and then put on some type of immersive, uh, you know, augmented reality, oh, not augmented, but actual virtual reality, and then see yourself in that end state. And, and then the feelings of that, the smells of that, I think that would be very powerful for sure. Yeah, absolutely. We can, we can, we use a lot of um, uh, neurological triggers of, uh, of uh, past experiences, mm -hmm. um, a lucky number that you may have, a color, a smell, uh, an old memory that we can uh, attach to a new memory. Uh, we never have the same memory twice. A lot of people think that, you know, when I think about my childhood, I'm remembering the exact way that it happened. No, you're not. Every time you've, you know, remembered that thing, whatever um, environment you're in right now gets attached to that. Um, we lose uh, 20, 30 percent of our memory around events from our past um, almost on a yearly basis. So unless it was a significant negative emotional experience, we don't really remember the, uh, all the positive stuff that's happened. Amazing. So when do you see these, um, these devices being rolled out? Like uh, are you in the development stage or, you know, when do we get to actually check all these out? We'll have our MVP by the end of this year. Hmm. And, um, right now I've got my, uh, my advisory team in place. I actually just hired a um, um, director of inner size product development who starts this month. And uh, so that's a new hire we just have. And uh, so our MVP will be done this year. And so sometime in 2022 uh, timeframe. 
Good for you. That's exciting. And you probably never thought 20 years ago when you retired uh, that you'd be in a whole new field, a whole new you know business. And that's that's the great thing is you know when you're enjoying life, you're moving about your passions and and what you should be doing. These things begin to expand and open up for you. So it's absolutely fantastic. For what I love. And I'd love to talk. So um, you have NeuroGym. Maybe, since I'm not as familiar with NeuroGym, could you talk about that for a minute? And then I'm going to talk about inner size and, and why I think that this is going to be helpful for a lot of people to pick up. So I started a company called uh, NeuroGym and the website's myneurogym.com to be able to share what I'm discovering and what our faculty of psychologists and brain researchers are finding um, with people out there who say, you know, I want to be healthier. I want to make more money. I want to have enough for retirement and more than enough. I want to be healthier. I want to have a better relationship. I want to have a deeper spiritual connection to source, whatever that is. And it's for anybody who um, doesn't want to settle for what is or what they have. Um, and they want to grow and develop and learn, but use evidence-based methodologies versus, you know, the metaphysical ones, which, um, are great to use, but we don't know exactly how they work yet. <laughs> I'll just say yet. And I'm assuming that just like we have gotten uh, better at, you know, brain scans and being able to look deeper and deeper, deeper into the human brain, um, we'll get deeper and deeper, uh, you know, into the fabric of nature itself as we are already discovering, you know, different elements in uh, the quantum field. So NeuroGym does that. So we have programs on winning a game of money, winning a game of fear, winning a game of procrastination, winning a game of weight loss, winning a game of business that rewires people's brains with our software that people listen to. Um, and most of our programs have got anywhere from seven to 12 levels. It's almost like, you know, level one is you know getting started. By the time you're in level seven, eight, nine, 10, level 12, your brain's getting a phenomenal new workout on your beliefs, your habits, self-image, uh, perspectives, paradigms, etc., uh, and then uh, we 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 have uh, we coach people on how to overcome the obstacles and how to create plans that win, uh, so that they have the support that they need as well. So I didn't just want to have the brain training side of it. I want to have the environment that people can actually share their successes, uh, get help with their challenges, and so that's what myneurogym.com is all about. Uh, and then I write. You know, I write and I do interviews to, to share some of the stuff. So my latest creation was around what I've been doing for 40 years is I have been intersizing. I have been doing the mental um, techniques on a daily basis. And the simple ones that everybody knows is visualization and mindfulness and meditation. Uh, but there's also advanced techniques like mental contrasting. Uh, there's subliminal um, uh, work that you can do as well while you're doing, you know, the, um, the, the conscious work. There's cognitive behavior therapy. There's cognitive priming techniques that you can do. There's a lot of techniques that the average person doesn't even know. They're not even doing the basic ones, let alone the advanced ones. So I created, you know, um, an entire body of work around inner sizing. So just like you can do 25 different exercises to strengthen your bicep, you can do 25 different exercises to strengthen your self-confidence or mm -hmm. your um, habit, um, you know, a, a constructive habit that you want. So, um, and that's why I wrote inner size. I trademarked the word, wrote the book, and um, now I'm creating hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of inner sizes that people could listen to and watch and then take action on to reinforce the pattern, um, including some high speed inner sizes that imprint onto the subconscious mind. Um, so again, some, some fundamental techniques and some advanced techniques that are proving themselves out uh, very, very well in the labs. That's great. And that's and for someone with a, a fitness background, which I do, that's how I got into this industry. I like the neuro gym and the inner size or uh, inner size and the inner size there I go with like jazzer size, uh, you know, the, the function there, because at any point in life, uh, if you decide to stop exercising, stop moving your body, it's going to atrophy. And it's really the same thing with the brain. I mean, I see it as that, or in your nervous system, that you're you're either going one way or the other. It's really difficult to stay in place. So these are things that you can Nothing do. Nothing stays the same. 
Right. There's no, there's no leveling out. Things are always in vibration. They're always moving. So it's like, okay, well, which way are they moving? And also what are you attracting? And so when you go to the gym, what are you more likely to do? Well, you're more likely to eat well, you're more likely to get to bed earlier. You're more, so you're, it's like, it's what it's leading to next, which is the part I like. One more question that I have for you, because I'm interested personally, was you, what is your daily inner size look like? Does it go hand in hand with your exercise? Do you do it before? Do you do it after? Do you prime the body when you wake up? Are you a little bit more relaxed now that you've kind of got this mastered? No. Um, so after I wake up, I do my, um, my gratitude work while I'm in bed as I put my feet on the floor and I am grateful for being able to do that every morning when I, when I'm able to do that, because some people didn't wake up. Uh, so I start with that as a holy I get another day, hopefully. Um, then I, um, after my, 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 my daily bathroom break, my early morning bathroom break, the first thing I do is meditation. So first thing I do is I just connect with the source of all supply. And we know that meditation is a different state of consciousness than sleep is um, or being awake is. So I do a meditation. Uh, following my meditation, I do my brain training audios, which are inner sizes that I've custom made for myself. All of my students uh, around the world have programs that we've already created for them. So they do their inner sizes. I open up, give me a second, I'll show you something. It'll be worth it because um, this is part of what I was just revising the last couple of days, but I have something called my exceptional life blueprint. Mm -hmm. And on this blueprint, I have, this is my working copy that I just worked on. So I have my vision board, you know, of my family, things that I either have achieved or that I'm working on, 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 um, on achieving. And then I have my vision for my health, my vision for my wealth, relations, career, business, uh, finances. I have my, my business destiny script, my money destiny script, my health destiny script that not only I read every day and I close my eyes and feel it every day, I've recorded it as well as part of my brain training and I listen to it every day hmm. to imprint the vision, the goals, the dreams, the why into my subconscious mind in a hypnagogic state, which is a quiet, relaxed state. Um, and uh, for that, I want to be in an alpha brainwave frequency. And so I do that every morning. Then I go and exercise for about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. Then I have my um, super duper smoothie. Mm -hmm. And I'm vegan now for about eight and a half years. And, um, and then after my shower, uh, I start work around 930 every day. That's a full morning right there before 9.30 a.m. So. Before 9.30, that's, that's me time. That's for my yes. spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical well-being. That is my SEMP model. So that's how I tap into the field of all possibilities. And it's not that I tap into it. I'm in the field. I just happen to be in this vibrational uh, frequency that's solid, but it's hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon all coalesced. Um, you know, into this sentient being that we call a human with the name of John with these features. Um, so I make sure that I remember that I am in the field. Everything is created from the field to and through me. Uh, so there's no thing that is missing. I just need to tune into what's already here. So I get this brain tuned in and I call that cognitive priming. And then I go about my day and my days are organized with, you know, my meetings, my time to think, uh, my time to get some breathing done every 55 minutes uh, after the hour that I'm not on an interview, a bell will go off on my uh, mobile phone and it'll just remind me to stop, reset through breath. Uh, I do inner size number one called take six, calm the circuits. That inner size number two is called IO, which is awareness, intention, action. So I want to be aware of the last 55 minutes of my thoughts, emotions, feelings, sensations, and behaviors without judgment, blame, shame, guilt, or justification, just awareness. Then I want to set an intention for the next hour. And then I say, what's the action I'm going to take right now to move in that direction? I do that about eight times a day. Why do I do that eight times a day? A, because it just gives me a chance to recalibrate every hour. 
B, I want to reinforce a pattern that then will reinforce me because it becomes a habit and habits reinforce themselves without thought or energy. So my brain knows I want to be in a state of awareness. My brain knows I want to be intentional. My brain knows I want to be proactive versus just active. Amazing. So very, very, very deliberate with time to goof off and have fun and not have any plans. But the the opening and closing of every day, I don't care where I am in the world, is the same. That's that's diet, great. Yeah. Diet the same. Right. So I don't deviate from my my inner game stuff, my diet, my food plan. I don't deviate from um, my sleep patterns very often. Um, and so there are certain things that are the, what I call are my keystone habits mm -hmm. that create the uh, foundation of high performance. In the middle, I can change. If somebody says, hey, let's do this instead of that. Sure, I can do that, but that's a deliberate choice. But you're not Absolutely. gonna get me to stop the pillars, okay, of my foundation. No, that's, I mean, that's fantastic. And that is you're, you're in a constant state of self-awareness. And if for some reason you drift, you have those timers that go off every 55 minutes, you can get right back on track. And I think that could be a big takeaway for people is that you're not micromanaging your day, you're overall macromanaging your life, moving it in the correct direction. And I think you know, by what, after 30 days or so, I know that we're going to need at least, you know, 66 plus days, uh, that it will become second nature, that it will become your identity. And if you think about what does an airplane do the moment you're airborne um, on the, you know, on the way from, let's say, New York to London, the airplane's off course 99.9% .9 of the time. But it has this mechanism that keeps adjusting, 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 you know, faster, slower, left, right, up, down. It's an automatic. It's a cybernetic mechanism is what it's called. It's a control and response mechanism. And so I want to train my psycho cybernetic mechanism to focus on what I want and to calibrate, 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 calibrate automatically. It's great. And then you're using that mind as the tuning fork, just, just say, Hey, listen, this is what we're working on. This is what has meaning. This is what I'm moving towards. And so, yeah, I think it's absolutely fantastic. I highly recommend people pick up a copy of inner size. And then from there, uh, once they get a good gist, they might already be, uh, understand a lot of this. The next step could be moving on to my neuro gym. We will link all of this up in the show notes here today. I want to allow you to have the last word, but I truly appreciate having you on here today. I learned a lot. I have no doubt our audience did as well. Thank you, Stephen. Well, this is my joy to uh, do the research, to be the guinea pig, um, and to, to share what uh, will hopefully make your life the masterpiece that you want it to be. I have this visual. You asked about my, my um, 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 rituals. One of my rituals um, that I love everybody to consider adopting is at the end of every night uh, when I'm in bed and I'm doing my gratitude um, exercise, um, I think back on my day. And like every artist, you know, likes to sign her work or his work. I create an image of my day and I sign it at the bottom. Now, why do I do that? Well, I do that because I want to remember that every day I am the architect and the painter and the artist of my life. And I want to be proud of what I create because every day is a brush stroke on that canvas. And some days, you know, the, the, the brush stroke is like dark. Oh my God. Oh, I don't like that. But when we step back, sometimes we look at those dark spots and those bright spots, the combination of all of them is what creates the masterpiece. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that I frame the things during the day in ways that create the masterpiece and empower me that I'm proud of. And I want to create that signature saying today was another day in my masterpiece. Tomorrow I will make it even better. So every day I want to close out my day with signing my day. And if everybody signs their day and is serious about making sure that the signature you put on the day is worthy of your life, worthy of your life because you just 
took 86,400 seconds of that day. And you did something with those 86,400 seconds. You wouldn't want to take $86,400 and just throw it to the wind, you know, where it's going to end up in the water and disintegrate. You may want to throw it in, in the wind where there's people that can benefit from it. That would give you a lot of joy. But to disintegrate, it would be like, oh, I just wasted it. I don't want to waste my life. And I don't want anybody else to either. Life is the gift. Let's teach, let's, let's use it as uh, it's how precious it really is. And time is what life is made of, as Bruce Lee said. So let's cherish our time, sign our day with pride. Well said. We're going to keep it at that for today. That was an amazing, beautiful way to close it. Thank you so much, John, for being on the show. And for everyone, please tune into those show notes. We're going to link up John's work and all the different books and opportunities that you can have to learn from him. Take care. Have an amazing day. <laughs>